All right, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and we'll begin our equipping hour together. Lord, thanks for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, and we think of those uh, in other places uh, who, for whom gathering together with your people is a challenge, even illegal, and uh, we just thank you for the immense privilege it is to be unmolested in our gathering together as your people, to hear your word, uh, to rejoice together in song, to speak truth to one another in love, uh, to build one another up in the body uh, of Christ. And we just pray this morning as we look at your church and what it means to pursue a unity that you describe and proscribe for us, uh, we pray that we would be filled with conviction and courage uh, to do things your way. And we ask for your help in it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're looking at part two of our study of ecumenical theology or ecumenism or the idea of bringing all denominations of Christendom into one unified body. We called this the attraction and dangers of Rodney King theology. Of course, the reference is to Rodney King, who in his impassioned plea after six days of Los Angeles riots said in a televised interview, can we just get along? I misquoted him. I wasn't going to misquote him. I'm going to get the quote right. He said, I just want to say, you know, can we all get along? Can we? Can we get along? And, and that is the cry of many in evangelicalism who have noticed what one writer has said are 33,000 different denominations in the world. Why all of the fractures? Uh, why can't Christians just drop their differences, get along together? Won't there be strength in numbers? Uh, won't the world see that we love each other if we don't have these barriers that divide us? And while I would suggest that that is a very well-meaning thought, it is, in fact, destructive to the truth, destructive to the church itself destructive of her mission, and destructive of God's definition of unity. So we're looking a couple of weeks ago, and this morning we'll finish up the attraction and dangers of Rodney King theology, or this idea that evangelicalism, we can all just get along by dropping our theological differences. And we looked last time we were together at the attractions of ecumenism. What is it that pushes this desire? And uh, if our first attraction is exegetical, it would come from John 17. And there Jesus says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, speaking of the 11 disciples in the upper room, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. And the impetus there is if Christians are one, if they're experiencing an organizational and relational unity, then they'll reflect the unity in the Trinitarian relationships and the world will believe that Jesus was actually sent by his Father. And that is Jesus' high priestly prayer. But what's critical in understanding Jesus' high priestly prayer is Jesus has an idea of what unity is like. And I believe the ecumenical movement is an attempt to answer Jesus' prayer in what Phil Johnson has called a cosmetic unity without anywhere near approaching Jesus' definition of unity, Jesus' description of unity, or Jesus' proscription of unity. In other words, what is required from Jesus himself, who is the head of the church, for the kind of unity that he had in mind in that prayer? And we will find that this is a unity around the truth. And while we looked at a number of the other attractions, some of the things like, well, fighting is bad, schisms are bad, uh, shouldn't middle ground and compromise be virtuous? Uh, we looked at some of those things that are sort of a natural tendency of attraction for us to drop our differences, meet somewhere in the middle, and all just get along for some greater, grander purpose. I won't go through that whole list again, but I do want to draw our attention to one that probably stands out above all other, others, which is a bit of a pragmatic motivation. And the pragmatic motivation is this, there is strength in numbers. There's strength in numbers. Everybody wants to be on a bandwagon. 
People love a crowd, and if everybody is going after something, if everybody is excited about something, there is a natural draw because something's happening right there. What's everybody looking at? Uh, Last weekend, we were on the 5 freeway in Los Angeles, northbound, and it became a parking lot very quickly on a Saturday afternoon. Nobody's going anywhere important. And yet we came to a complete halt on the freeway. And there are six lanes to choose from. And they were all filled and they were all stopped. Why were they all stopped? Because a dump truck southbound on the five freeway had run into a light pole. Now, it didn't stop any of the lanes that we were in. Except the desire to see what was going on brought everything in Southern California to a screeching halt. You've experienced that phenomenon. People want to know what everybody else wants to know. People want to be around what everybody else is around. If there's a crowd gathered, ooh, 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 I got to know what that is. And I think there is the thought that if Christians can gather a crowd There's strength in that crowd. There's power in that crowd. There's a created interest in what is going on in that crowd. And I think that is part of the history of this church in its first iteration. This church was a very popular ministry on the campus of Arizona State University. And lots of people came because lots of people were coming. And there's something to the the crowd magnetism that is a pragmatic appeal for Christians to join arms together as a show of strength in numbers, a show of force, a show of mass interest, a show of popularity. And if we get enough people working together, surely the world will take notice. I think that is one of the great appeals of the ecumenical movement. In order to do that, in order to have linked arms with lots of people in a population center that the world would notice, we have to get along. In order to get along, we have to drop some of our differences, set them aside for a moment, not compromise them, not not walk away from them, or so it is said. And you have to ask this idea of broad influence or impressing the world with a large movement, this idea of strength in numbers, it is strength for what? Strength for what? I believe it is a strength for drawing a crowd, but that is not the same thing as winning people to the gospel through Jesus Christ. You see, having strength in numbers and amassing an interest especially drawing the eye of the unbelieving world to what is going on with that large group of people getting together, that does not have the power to transform spiritually dead people into spiritually alive people. It has power to draw a crowd. The strength of numbers has the strength to draw numbers, to draw attention. But that is not a supernatural mechanism. And you and I understand in the gospel that a supernatural mechanism is required for eternal life. And what we've seen time and time again in sort of the mass movement, man-made approaches to get converts is the sad state of affairs that lots of people professed faith Because of the draw of the crowd, everybody's doing it. I got swept up in the bandwagon approach to whatever's going on. And while many people made professions, many, if not most of those in these mass movements walked away from those professions. And there's nothing new in this. I mean, you go back to the Second Great Awakening and Charles Finney, who said at the end of his life, I believe it was my lot in life to bring about tens of thousands of spurious conversions. Finney invented all kinds of ways to draw a crowd and to get people emotionally ginned up to make a decision for Jesus. But then to have been inoculated to the gospel by having embraced it without understanding it, having an emotional response to a a message well taught or compellingly delivered, but never having come to grips with his own sin before a holy God never having met Christ personally through the saving work of the gospel. And so you have, by his own account, tens of thousands of people who spuriously believed. 
and then we're not walking with Christ again. The result of that second great awakening in large part was Midwestern America became known as the burned over district. Large swaths of upstate New York were called burned over evangelistic ground, where if someone went in to try to preach the gospel in these areas, they said, been there, done that, heard it already, no thank you. And instead of winning people to Christ in a way that transcends generations, it inoculated entire regions to the gospel itself. And you have a similar pattern in the Billy Graham Crusades. By the way, I'm indebted tremendously for this lecture to a few resources, but I would point out one to you as a uh, highly recommended. It is Ian Murray's Evangelicalism Divided. Ian Murray's Evangelicalism Divided. It is essentially a church history of the 20th century in America and in England and does a better job of explaining why does the evangelical church look the way it does today than any other book I know. And given the fact that 20th century church history is probably the closest and most significant segment of church history for us today, Ian Murray's Evangelicalism Divided might be the best church history book you ever read. That's my sales pitch. But if you want to understand what went wrong with Billy Graham, how does a man who is a stalwart of convictions for biblical inerrancy, who filled his sermons with the statement, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, and preached heart-rending, serious sermons about eternity and heaven and hell and the need to believe the gospel, how does a man who became famous for that style of preaching in the end believe that there is no difference between Roman Catholicism and evangelicalism in terms of salvation. And so you need to read Ian Murray's book to kind of understand not only the Billy Graham phenomenon, the Billy Graham Crusades, but the ecumenical movement both in England and in America at the seminary level, university level, popular level, crusade level, and all the rest. This motivation to get people together to link arms for a, some common enterprise is a human mechanism. That is a human idea, a man-made ingenuity. That is not God's plan. God's plan, as we'll talk about later this morning, is local ecclesiology. That is a clinging to the truth under qualified leaders in the local church. That is God's plan for the expansion of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And that really is the protection against the ecumenical spirit. The bottom line is the flesh begets flesh, only spiritual things beget spiritual results. And so we must be about God's business, God's way. The attempt to come up with a, a human way of linking arms together to accomplish eternal purposes is flawed from the beginning. When you have to compromise on truth to win people to the truth, you will only ever beget compromise. So let's talk about the dangers of ecumenism. First of all, doctrinal indifference. Uh, this is the, the primary initial danger of the ecumenical spirit. It produces doctrinal indifference. In order to link arms with people with whom you disagree, you have to compromise. You have to say, I'll give up this if you give up that, and we're just not going to talk about these things. And we talked about that a little bit in the, in the realm of missions, and it was 150 years ago when denominational missionaries went outside of North America and worked together, and when the Baptist, the Methodist, and the Presbyterian all get together to do missions, and they can't talk about church polity or modes of baptism, um, you have a problem because then you birth a church that has no categories for those things and the leaders, the, the missionaries and uh, the pastors of those churches do not learn to develop biblical convictions on church polity or baptism. And so it's just okay to believe whatever you want and it becomes a theological free-for-all and, and a spineless ecclesiology that does not cling to the word of God. And when those missionaries came back to the United States, they said, look, we got together on the mission field. We should learn to get together here. We can get great big things done. And so the mainline denominations began to seek out unity and compromise and drop their doctrinal distinctives. That's not to say that all of those denominational distinctives were accurate. On an issue like baptism, there's only one biblical view of baptism. <laughs> 
But it's not okay to say, since there are four views, it's okay to believe anything you want. No, you have to search the scriptures and come up with God's view of baptism or God's view of church polity or God's view of doing ministry. Some have said that a fractionalized universal church, a church with 33,000 denominations is unhealthy. And the way to get the church healthy is to bring them all together. That will show we're one body and not many parts. And Ian Murray has said the health of the church is never better on display than when local churches know the difference between right and wrong, truth and error, and help sheep know God's word. That's the mark of a healthy church. Collaboration with disagreement requires minimizing or eliminating disagreements. What's interesting in the ecumenical movement, both in England and America, is you had leaders of churches that decided, we want to get together with other leaders of other churches and other denominations, and you would link arm with the, this guy over here, and that guy's linking arms with someone else, and eventually down the line, you've got your arms linked with somebody that you disagree with a lot more than the guy right next to you. But the collaboration now demands that my unity with him implies a unity with everybody else down the line. And, and at some point, that makes everybody uncomfortable unless you go all the way to the end of the ecumenical movement, which is universalism. And we'll talk about that danger at the end. But you cannot discipline leaders who defect from the truth. What happens to the, the person you're collaborating with, the organization or the institution or the church you're collaborating with, five links down the line, who begins to deny essential doctrines, like the atonement, that, that Jesus died in place of sinners at the cross, or the deity of Christ, or the virgin birth, or the inerrancy of the scriptures. All of a sudden, those relationships that we thought were going to be gained for influence in the world become a liability for truth, because how in the world can I stand up and say, the Bible says, when that guy five links down the road doesn't believe the Bible says? And in order to maintain the political unity, I have to sacrifice essential truth. And that is precisely what happened in the 20th century. If I seek to join hands with everyone who is evangelical, for instance, and some of those who are evangelical decide to join hands with non-evangelicals out of an ecumenical unity. Now I'm joined to the non-evangelicals, if the word evangelical even means anything anymore. So the first real danger of ecumenism is doctrinal indifference. The second is that we deny and practice what we affirm in public statements. This is the real challenge, and we'll just take the gospel as the, as the example, that we can affirm the gospel in theory. I believe the only way to heaven is belief, faith alone, in Christ alone, finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross to satisfy God's wrath against sin. That is the only way to heaven. I can believe that. I can put that in my statements. We can make that the banner of ecumenical unity. And the problem is, if we start to unify with people who call themselves Christians, and we have no grounds to say, no, you're not a Christian because you denied essential truth, that's uncharitable, that's ungracious, that divides, that destroys the ecumenical spirit. If we take people's profession at face value, even if they deny things like the gospel itself, Listen to Alistair McGrath, 1993, he said this, I have no intention of claiming that evangelicalism is the only authentic form of Anglicanism. My concern is simply to insist that evangelicalism is a legitimate and respectable option. Now, this is a well-known English evangelical, uh, an author who many Christians have read. And he's, he obviously is portraying his Anglicanism, his loyalty to the Church of England, as a higher priority than his loyalty to the gospel. The gospel does not become a dividing line for him in his church. It doesn't separate for him Christians and non-Christians. He has a view of Christianity that is Anglican but not evangelical. And he wants to put forward evangelicalism as just one legitimate form of Anglicanism. My friends, that's a problem. 
We'll get to the solution to this in a moment, but if you are drawn to loyalty to a body of people that are unified around some purpose that is not the gospel, then you deny the gospel by that unity. Alistair McGrath can say, hey, I'm an evangelical. I love the gospel. I believe that's the only way to heaven. But look, here are all these other really good Christians. (laughs) And you've just denied the very thing you claim to believe by claiming evangelical status. A third danger here is this, of course, tones down New Testament warnings. The Bible is not silent on the issue of division over doctrinal differences. In fact, the Bible does not say erase your doctrinal differences to form some sort of sham unity, but quite the opposite. The Bible commands us to separate from those who do not uphold the truth. And when you pursue an ecumenical unity, you have to silence God's word. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, gives this explicit warning. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. They will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober, endure hardship. The command to Timothy and the command to the the churches throughout church history is very clear. We must resist the sliding away from sound or healthy doctrine. And that is a warning. Listen to Titus chapter 1. Verse 10 and 11, there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. What is the clear biblical injunction for people teaching errant doctrine? Silence them, mute them, in perhaps today's parlance, cancel them. (laughs) As it relates to evangelicalism, these things are not to be tolerated. Tolerance of error is not a virtue. Any more than tolerance for cyanide is a healthy snack in your otherwise good food. Listen to 2 John. You can turn there if you like. This is a strong prohibition. Second John's not an easy one to find. It takes up half a page. But it's near the end of your Bible. Second John, we'll read all three chapters, 9, 10, and 11. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. That is a severe rebuke to the Billy Graham model of inviting unbelievers to the platform to share the stage in evangelistic crusades. You just can't do that. That's a violation of this principle. It's not even uh, inviting them into your home and giving them a greeting. It's putting them on the platform with you for gospel ministry. That is a, that is a mistake that um, I think will be regretted severely. Teachers that should be silenced and rejected are instead embraced in the ecumenical movement in the hopes that they and their adherents could be one to the truth. What a tragic strategy that has turned out to be. Another danger of the ecumenical movement is the tolerance of tolerance. The tolerance of tolerance. That means we tolerate the idea of tolerating all views, contradictory views. There are views that lead to heaven and eternal life through Christ, and there are views that lead to unbelief and eternal destruction, and we're just going to tolerate all of them. The command to tolerate one another in the New Testament is a command for believers who are unified in Christ to put up with each other, 
because we're sinners. And if we're in close proximity, we're going to sin against each other and we need to be quick to forgive, slow to take offense, tolerate one another. But the idea of believers tolerating error, and I don't mean just like the error of people in the world, but the error of teachers who are teaching error. The idea of tolerating that kind of error is no virtue at all. It ends, the toleration of tolerance ends with the intolerance of tolerance. And what I mean by that is the, the, what D.A. Carson pointed out, uh, the idea that um, those who promote the idea of tolerance love tolerance so much that the only thing they will not tolerate is someone who doesn't tolerate error. So you're fine, you can believe anything you want as long as you don't believe it exclusively. As long as you don't believe it is the only truth. You, you can have your little truths, but you can't have capital T truth. That is the one offensive thing. William Barclay is a New Testament scholar, a Scottish, um, who wrote volumes and volumes of New Testament commentaries that, that people have used throughout the years. And he said, I am not likely condemn, to condemn a man's beliefs. I shall only think him wrong if he refuses to extend to men the same sympathy that I extend to him. So you're not wrong if you believe a bunch of different things. You're only wrong if you don't give the kind of charity that I do to people who believe differently. That is not New Testament charity. Another danger, I would just call this the hoodwink. It is the big trick. It is the pitfall. It's where we say you fell victim to one of the classic blunders, the first of which is never get involved in a land war in Asia. The second and only slightly less well known is this. <laughs> when you try to leverage influence with unbelievers by pleasing them, you will find yourself to be hoodwinked. It's a trap. It's a trap. Early on, liberal, liberal Anglican and Roman Catholic involvement with Billy Graham crusades uh, was uh, welcomed by Billy Graham for the express purpose of influencing them towards the truth, to get liberals to start to believe the Bible for the first time, and to get Catholics to believe in justification by faith alone. He wanted to reach Catholics with the gospel. He wanted to introduce liberal Anglicans to an appreciation of people who actually believe the Bible. Those were his stated goals. But eventually, Billy Graham said, I have no quarrel with the Catholic Church. What does John Huss think about that? What does William Tyndale think about that? What did Martin Luther think about that? I have no quarrel with the Catholic Church. What do those of you who have been saved out of Roman Catholicism think about a statement like that? And you see how it wasn't very long, just a matter of decades between Billy Graham with a stated purpose of saying, hey, let's have Catholics involved because they'll bring their people and we can preach the gospel to them, to eventually him saying they don't need the gospel, they're Christians already. And that is the hoodwink, that is the real trap, that is the blunder. Billy Graham said, I don't think the differences are important as far as personal salvation is concerned. Billy Graham said, I feel I belong to all the churches. I am equally at home in an Anglican or a Baptist or a Brethren Assembly or a Roman Catholic Church. Today, we have almost 100% Catholic support in this country. That was not true 20 years ago. And the bishops and the archbishops and the Pope are our friends. And so while the initial goal was to bring the gospel to these various groups, the end conclusion was that these groups already have the gospel. They already have what they need. They're on their way to heaven. They're Christians. And Billy Graham said, the ecumenical movement has broadened my viewpoint. And the goal is to leverage the draw of an unbeliever or an entire system of unbelief in the hopes that you could use that leverage to produce belief but you've compromised the truth itself. And unbelief leveraged our gullibility to water down our message to no longer be offensive to unbelievers. Who tricked whom? That's the real problem with the bait and switch. 
right? And any pragmatic approach to ministry that says, I got to come up with some human mechanism to trick people into coming and hearing about Christ. Number one, it, it lacks integrity. But second, is the, it is the same blunder all over again because whatever you have to do to draw those people in is the same thing you're going to have to keep doing over and over and over again to keep them. Any thought that I can get them in and then once they're in, I'll turn it on them and tell them that their sinner is going to hell. <laughs> Never works because you empty the place and the project is over. Evangelicalism always loses in that gamble. Another danger of the ecumenical movement is the death of evangelism and the death of missions. Listen, when you get to the point where you say, we're not going to question whether somebody is really a Christian if they say they're a Christian. Doesn't matter what they believe, doesn't matter what they deny, doesn't matter what they affirm. If they say they're a Christian, boy, that's just unloving for me to say otherwise. Anytime you go down that road, you unite yourself to unbelief unchecked, unbelief unapproachable, unbelief unassailable. You cease doing evangelism with people who are on their way to the eternal lake of fire. And you say they're off limits. That is exactly what unbelief wants. <laughs> Quit talking to me about my sin. Quit saying I need a fundamental change. I'm fine the way I am. Okay, you say you're fine the way you are. You're fine the way you are. We'll just go with that so we can get along and we can work to reach all those other people who we both can agree aren't fine. And the ecumenical movement in England united itself around the idea of baptism. People are brought into Christianity by being baptized as babies. And so Anglicans and Presbyterians and Catholics, look, we're, we're all together in this. That became their unifying principle. In the hopes of exposing more people to the truth, bridges are built to reach those people. But you have to believe that the chasm over which the bridge is built is God himself and the truth of his word. Listen, unbelievers need to be confronted with the great impossible chasm of God. Isaiah 59, your sins have separated you from God. His arm's not so short that he, short that he can't heal you. His ears, aren't so dull, or his ears aren't so dull that he can't hear you. His arm's not so short that he can't save you. But your sins have made a separation. There's blood on your hands. And you have to come to grips with the fact that you are enmity with God because of your crimes against him at a cosmic level. To wash away that chasm through some sort of human temporal commonality is to erase all of the good news. Can't have the good news without the great big problem that sinners must be rescued from God. They must be rescued by God and they must be rescued unto God. And we get rid of that, we get rid of everything that is Christianity. When we get rid of God's rigidity, his demands, his exclusive claims, his bloody atonement, his miracles, his method for saving sinners, and we get rid of these things, then we can have common ground with unbelief. And surely, when we stand on that common ground of unbelief, unbelievers will suddenly do what? Believe? No, we've just punted on everything we have to offer to unbelievers in order to have common ground with unbelievers. Listen, this is why in our own personal evangelism, we, we don't rely on our own ability to find some sort of common ground, to make appeal, to be pleasing to men so that they will like us, so that it will get a hearing. We certainly don't want to be offensive for offense's sake, but we cannot compromise the truth of what is actually glorious and good news in order for people to know and understand and love the glorious good news. We've told people they don't need to repent of their empty ceremonialism or their Bible-denying theologies. We can have fellowship, we can have camaraderie, we can have partnership unto a common cause. That's what the ecumenical movement has told unbelievers who play church. And the hope is, look, the world will see that we're all one. And what has the world seen? <laughs> yeah, 
everybody unified in the church around being just like the world. And nothing to offer the world when you do that. And the end result of all of that is universalism. When unity trumps doctrine, there is no end to the expansion of the camaraderie, of the fellowship, of the getting together. And this is exactly what Billy Graham said in his interview with Robert Schuller, that he was convinced that people who had never heard about Christ, never been confronted of their sin, would go to heaven because there is a wideness in God's mercy. That's a tragedy. The tragedy of the ecumenical movement in the 20th century is not new. Uh, you can look back through history. Um, Carl F.H. Henry fought this in the academic level. Um, J.C. Ryle fought this in his own day. You can read about the downgrade controversy with Spurgeon. Uh, throughout history, there have been compromises over truth in the hopes of accomplishing some grand purpose. What is the answer to the ecumenical movement? I think Martin Lloyd-Jones was right in the mid-60s observing the ecumenical movement, and he was a, he was a big-hearted pastor who, lo who longed for revival and had seen revival in Wales, had read about it from his early childhood, wanted to see it across Europe, wanted to see it uh, circumnavigate the globe. And he prayed for that, he longed for that, he preached for revival. And so he wanted Christians to work together uh, around the central doctrines of the scriptures and the gospel. But he began to see what was happening with his pers personal, close and personal friends uh, in England diving into this ecumenical movement. And he said, what's critical are two questions. What is a Christian and what is the church? And if you get those two questions right, you start to head off the dangers of the ecumenical spirit. If you ask the question, what is a Christian? You begin with things like John 3, a man must be born again. You understand that a supernatural work by the Holy Spirit has to take place personally, individually, where a sinner comes confronted with his sin before a holy God and embraces Christ alone. It's a miraculous work. It is a work of the Spirit of God. It is a work that God uses proclaimers to bring about. He uses prayer to bring about. But in the end, it is his work. It cannot be manufactured. Jesus said of, John, of this Holy Spirit in John 3, uh, the, the wind blows where it wishes, so also the Holy Spirit. Uh, the flesh only brings about flesh. Any human contrivance can only bring about human results. But if you understand what a Christian is, a supernatural being born from above, uh, that draws some very hard lines. Uh, who is a Christian and who is not becomes of critical importance. And if you get the definition of the church right, that the church properly is made up of believers. The church is made up of believers. Now, it's true in any given assembly uh, there are no doubt people who are believers in that assembly and people who are not. But the New Testament definition of the church is those who are gathered, who are called out by God in the gospel, born again and indwelt by his Holy Spirit. They are part of the body of Christ. To assume that the church is something like a state church or a denominational wing or, or some political wing of a denomination is to misunderstand what the church is. And at the end of his commentary series in Ephesians, Martin Lloyd-Jones has a phenomenal essay on the unity of the church where he describes this very thing. It's very big-hearted. We, we want everybody who actually knows Christ and loves Christ to feel their unity biblically, to understand it rightly. We love unity. But there is no unity across the line of regeneration. And so in the church, in the operation of the church, what is a Christian then leads us to a right definition of what is the church. The church is the gathering of born-again people. And many have asked, well, can a Catholic be a Christian? I mean, is it possible for somebody to be in a cult or be in a false religion or, or be in a, a defunct apostate version of New Testament Christianity and, and become a believer? And I would say yes, and, and I will just let Ian Murray speak to this. Ian Murray says, no one doubts that the grace of God may enable an individual 
an individual Anglo-Catholic or a Roman Catholic to see beyond a dangerous ritualism and to grasp enough of the gospel to be a Christian. Nobody doubts that. But it is another thing to say that the Catholic system teaches the way of salvation truly, that its priests are colleagues in New Testament ministry, and that its adherents are all entitled to be regarded as Christians. And that's the right perspective. Martin Luther was a Catholic for a long time after he was born again. And many others of the Reformation era remained Catholics for a time until essentially the division was so clear they were spit out, run out, or killed. Uh, I'm reading a biography of Peter uh, Vermilli of Italy, uh, who as a Catholic scholar, as a Catholic priest, um, begins to understand the gospel by the reading of God's word and preaching justification by faith alone to those Catholics around him, many of whom became genuine believers inside the church and then had to flee. It certainly is possible. But that's different than saying to the leaders of apostate Christian organizations, let's link arms together for common purpose. This requires us to have a biblical ecclesiology. A biblical ecclesiology or a a way of thinking about the church demands local church work. God writes through Peter to the elders, shepherd the flock of God among you. There's not a command there to link arms in broad denominational categories to get things done in the world. That is the way the man the way man thinks. How are we going to get the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth? I know what we need. We need one big conglomeration and broadcasting everywhere and just get it to everybody all at one time. (laughs) We're impatient that way. We want to get rich quick scheme for world evangelism. And God's way is small, often invisible, but it's local. Churches of believers being equipped, Ephesians 4.12, for the work of ministry of taking the gospel to their neighborhoods. And we need biblical faithful churches that multiply. We need biblical faithful churches that send people where the gospel has not been heard. But it is all local ecclesiology that is God's design for the church, for the world. We must be committed to doing God's business God's way. I want to close our time with just looking at a few texts to draw some principles from. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. No doubt this is a familiar verse, 2 Corinthians 6.14. Paul says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? This is a prohibition against a partnership with unbelief for spiritual purposes. You may have heard this from your parents as the dating verse, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. It's the, it's the uh, reason that Christians should not marry non-Christians. Now, that is certainly an application of this verse, but the primary application is just the fundamental relationship that believers and unbelievers don't have in terms of spiritual enterprise to join hands with people who are not regenerate in the hopes of bringing about gospel purpose is a violation of this text. And this principle couldn't be any more clear. And really, we need to fast forward the tape. We need to think eternally in this regard. It may seem like a a quick remedy to get together, (laughs) But to follow the script, to to follow God's prohibition here and refuse to link arms with those who don't know Christ for the sake of gospel purposes um, is actually to trust the Lord and, and to be involved in gospel endeavor that he will bless rather than gospel endeavor that he will burn up in the Bema Seat judgment. 
Turn to 1 John chapter 1. We'll look at verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. What comes out in this verse is unity, fellowship, is possible between humans only when we are walking in the light categorically, to be in Christ, to be in his son, then we have true fellowship with one another. This gets back to our uh, recipe for unity. Do we get unity by looking at each other, noticing our differences, compromising and getting closer and closer to each other until we can be in the same spot? No, we, we get real biblical unity when we are looking to Christ, the head. And the closer we get to him, the closer we will find ourselves to each other. That is true biblical unity. And that unity, that fellowship is possible as we walk in the light. Someone who is categorically in darkness cannot have this kind of fellowship. Look at 1 John 4, verses 5 and 6. Actually, we'll back up to verse 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, if you were to just drop in on this text, you might think, what a terrible evangelistic strategy this is. Um, wait, wait, don't we want the world to listen to us? I mean, don't we? <laughs> we have a message. We are ambassadors of Christ. We want to proclaim it to every creature under heaven. And what John is getting at is here is that those who are being drawn by God, those who are being born again by the Spirit of God, those who know God are those in whom the message of God resonates. They are on frequency. They're, they're tuning into the station supernaturally that the message of the gospel is being broadcast on. And, and what is the difference between the world and God's little children here? God's children hear the message. They listen to it, and the world doesn't. But, but those guys, they're from the world, and the world listens to them. Do, do you hear that attraction? Look, how are we going to get the world to listen to us? We want the world to listen to us. Let's all get together. Well, if the world is listening, it's listening because the, a worldly message is resonating with a worldly audience. You and, you and I should never be disappointed in faithful proclamation of the truth of God when it is ignored. <laughs> now, do we pray for a reception of that message? Yes, by supernatural power. And we know that will be successful. God has already promised that people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people will hear and will believe. But we don't change the station. We don't change the message in order to get a hearing Oh, good, the world's listening to us now. Ooh, be careful. You might be saying what they want to hear, and that's not what they need. There's a dividing line between truth and error, and our unity is clarified, and our evangelistic targets are clarified when we know the difference between truth and error. You can write down 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Those two chapters just prohibit Christians from using man-made tools for doing supernatural work. Now, there are two sermons on our website under the Philosophy of Ministry series from those two chapters. Uh, you can listen to those. But the fundamental category of 1 Corinthians 2.14 is the natural man does not understand spiritual things. Spiritual, supernatural power is required. 1 John 2.10. And we think about the, the idea that they will know us by our love for one another. Listen to what 1 John 2.10 says. The one who loves his brother abides in the light. 
The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. Uh, what is the one another that we are to love? It is brothers and sisters in Christ. The world will know us by our love for one another. The ecumenical movement wants to turn that into love everything and love everybody indiscriminately, and then they'll know you're Christians. And the reality is believers are to have such a transcendent, surpassing love for one another that the world sees, oh, they've got the light. They're abiding in the light. Look at that transformation. You cannot have that in the ecumenical movement. Ephesians 4 gives us the description of what true unity is. It's a unity in the truth, in the church, under Christ who is the head. Jude 3 tells us to contend for the faith, once for all handed down to the saints. There's a contending, not to be contentious people, but to contend for truth. It is too precious to lose. 1 Timothy 4, 6, Paul tells Timothy, you're a good servant of Christ Jesus when you call out error and you name names. The flip side of that is you're not a good servant of Christ Jesus when you just tolerate it. 2 John 10 and 11 gives the clear prohibition, we looked at it earlier, of not giving a greeting to false teachers. Why? Because you share in their evil. You have to understand, the, the father of lies, the God of this world, is very religious. He's very involved in church. He's very involved in church politics. He's very involved in organizations and denominations. He loves to mix in error with truth so as to eliminate the truth. And when false systems teach false doctrine and lead people to eternal destruction, it is evil. And to partner with, to participate with, to endorse is to share in that evil. In Galatians 1.10, I'll leave you with this last verse. Paul just says, if I were still pleasing men, I would not be a slave of Christ. Anything we do that is man-pleasing in its scheme is fundamentally opposed to our slavery to Christ. Pleasing fallen man is not a commendable strategy for winning fallen man to the gospel. It's not God's strategy. It doesn't work. Um, and it's not pleasing to the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these sessions. We do thank you for the painful reminder of the last century of the demise of evangelicalism in our country um, through perhaps big-hearted desires to seek a unity. Lord, we, we want to have a big heart that looks forward to the day when everyone is united in Christ who loves you. There will be no more error. There will be no more mis misunderstanding. We truly will live up to your prayer in John 17. We long for that day. We want to work towards that in whatever degrees you give us uh, access to that here and now but we want to follow your plan for that, laboring with each other, loving one another selflessly, but always laboring in the truth. And we pray that you'd help us to that end, that the world might know that the Father sent you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.